Tak nampak apa-apa pun persuasive language. Um, however, we have uh, already go through persuasive language. Uh, we go in the Sudan presentation the week before. And also next week, uh, we're supposed to be talking about listening skill, but we have already gone through that. Um, so week eight is supposed to be uh, critical thinking. Um, so I'm, I will just um, briefly go through um, critical thinking, which is supposed to be um, uh, thought in week eight. Okay. Um, so don't forget to um, key in your attendance uh, spectrum and. On your screen, you should see the uh, presentation schedule uh, for today. <clears throat> so we have 12 uh, talks <clears throat> this afternoon. So those are the titles. And for each talk, I have assigned a single person to ask uh, at least two questions to the presenter. Okay, so, um, so after so the start is five minutes, so each one is given five minutes. So after the duration uh, has ended, um, so the person assigned to ask questions can, uh, can start asking questions. Okay. Um, so uh, the schedule has been uh, put up for four weeks. Okay. Uh, so you can look look this up in the file section of our teams. I have also uploaded the same file uh, at Spectrum. You can view there as well. So until 14th of December. Okay. <clears throat> Before um, ah okay. After the uh QA session has ended, um I want each of you to give a score to the uh, to the presenter. So 
Okay, I'll, I'll give a link for something like this. Uh, I will give this link at, uh, after every um, after every presentation. So you need to. Uh, there are three things that you need to evaluate whether you can understand the topic that the presenter was talking about, whether the presentation was interesting, and whether uh, the presenter uh, adequately answered all the all the questions uh, that, that were asked uh, after the after the uh, after the talk. <coughs> Uh, but before we start your talk, uh, we'll just um, briefly talk about uh, critical thinking. Um, and so this, today we have a background music. I hope, I hope you enjoy the background music uh, today. Mm. <laughs> critical thinking. So this course is called uh, Thinking and Communication Skills. One of the topics in this course is critical thinking. So what does critical thinking mean um, if you look at the meaning of each word? Okay, uh, critical thinking. So um, thinking according to uh, the Oxford Dictionary Thinking is the process of considering or reasoning about something. So, for example, you're considering to use a particular method. Uh, so you have several methods in order to uh, make something efficient. So how are you going to choose between um, the different uh, methods, for example? Or you're considering to uh, to believe in something, okay. uh, for example, the Earth is flat, or vaccines are um, some conspiracy uh, that were uh, concocted by some uh, some some group. Um, so uh, things like that. Well, maybe you're considering whether you want to buy a uh, PS5 when it. Uh, when it's available maybe next year. So that is, uh, that is example of when you want to consider something. And then uh, reasoning. Um, what, what does it even mean? Uh, according to the assertion again, the action of thinking about something in a logical and sensible way. Uh, meaning that um, your uh, how you interpret something or your your line of thought and the definition for reasoning has uh, you're thinking about something in a sensible way so sensible means that um, it is done or chosen according to wisdom or, or prudence and it is likely to be of benefit to, to us or to, to somebody else. So that is uh, thinking according to the definition, uh, the dictionary definition. <coughs> so what about critical? Uh, again, according to the Oxford Dictionary, expressing or involving an analysis of the merits and faults of a work of literature, music, or art. So the merits and the faults, um, so the pros and cons, uh, so what are the advantages uh, versus what are the disadvantages of a certain work. And the definition also 
um, involves the objective analysis and evaluation of an issue in order to form a judgment. So before you make a decision, so you you make an objective analysis, an analysis that is not um, that is not affected by emotions or uh, or um, or half baked uh, facts. Okay, um, so you make an objective analysis about something. Okay, before you. Uh, make a decision. Okay, for example, to, to do something uh, or to believe in something. Okay, so that's uh, basically um, uh, word by word what uh, thinking and critical means. Um, so there, there's there are uh, slides uploaded on second. Uh, I, I did not make this slide, okay? uh, but we just go through um, and I'll just highlight the things that, that I think should be highlighted. Um, <coughs> so we have already, we have already uh, looked at this, what does um, thinking means. Um, So you think when you want to solve problems, uh, when you want to reason for something, when you want to make decisions. Okay, so um, when you want to solve problems, you want to make decisions, you want to make, um, typically you want to make the right decision. In order to make the right decision, you need to analyze something objectively. And who here watched the Netflix show um, a documentary about Bill Gates on Netflix? Does anyone here watch that documentary? Uh, uh, Inside Bill Gates' brain, I think. Inside Bill's brain, decoding Bill Gates. Um, okay, so, so if you have a here have uh, Netflix, you can uh, watch this. It's a key. Uh, three season, uh, three episode, uh, three episode of the um, So he talks about uh, uh, Bill Gates. I only managed to watch uh, just the first few part, and I haven't watched the third one. But, um, but, um, do you know, uh, so the, the director asked him a question, uh, what is his worst uh, fear? Um, so did you guys know what Bill, uh, what Bill answered? So the director asked Bill Gates, what is his biggest fear? <laughs> okay, other answers? Um, so maybe. Yeah. Pennywise, I think. Pennywise, Pennywise, we can. Um, okay. Now that, uh, okay, he answered, um, uh, he's afraid that he's 
He's afraid that his brain uh, will stop working or something like that. He will not be able to uh, effectively use his brain. I'm not sure why he answered that. Maybe because the title of the documentary is called Inside His Brain. So maybe he answered it um, um, just for the sake of the similarity of the title of the um, documentary. Uh, but but if, you, if you watch his um, if you if you watch this documentary, only watch the first two episodes. Now he he is someone who reads who reads a lot. So there will be uh, several books that he would read. Um, I think every week or every two weeks, and it will be uh, so it will be different set of books. Um, every two weeks or so, something like that. So, so he, he reads a lot. And he has what he called uh, thinking week. Uh, thinking week, where he will spend alone uh, somewhere, uh, just reading uh, maybe research papers or books um, alone uh, for one week. So, um, for me, I'm, I'm not sure about you guys, but um, due to the amount of work that, that I have, I, I seldom have time to do. But I think um, reading is something that uh, we, we all must do. You know, at least you know, in a year, uh, try to read uh, good books. Um, um, not just uh, not just uh, novels, but maybe uh, some um, non-fiction books or books that have whose author um, was a Nobel Prize winner, okay, for example. Um, so try uh, try uh, reading those kind of books, um, which is uh, advice for myself as well. Um, so if you if you if you read a lot, uh, if you read a lot, so you, you, you are exposed to a lot of information. So you, you can expand your way of thinking. Okay? You may have one view of uh, thinking about something, but after you have uh, perhaps uh, read um, several books, um, uh, your mind will, will, will see see certain issues in. in it is slightly different perspective. Mm. Okay, um, so if you if you ask Professor Google uh, what critical, critical thinking means, so, and also Mr. Wikipedia, so there are um, there are many definitions given to critical thinking. But if you look at the end of this sentence as a guide to belief and action. So in the end, uh, your thinking process will serve as a guide uh, to what you want to believe, okay? What you want, what you want to hold to, what you want to hold on to, and, and what you want to do okay, after you have done the thinking process. So the, the output of that. Uh, so what what whatever happens uh, in between. Uh, so you want to believe whether the earth is flat, okay, for example. Um, so you need to go through um, the process of objectively analyzing it before uh, you, you believe in something or do something or take action. Mm. Okay, you can just read the slides. Okay, I'm um, just um, going to highlight uh, a few things in the slide. 
So critical thinking is not just merely negative criticism about something. Um, it's not us rejecting an idea because it's not from our side or it's not from our uh, party, for example. It's not just it's not merely rejecting, you know, what the other party uh, is uh, proposing, or um, not just merely uh, membangkang okay, something. Um, so it involves, like I mentioned earlier, an objective analysis. Analysis that that is not affected by emotion, so it's based on on facts, uh, on on facts and figures. Okay, on not on misinformation, not based on uh, gossip. Okay. Um, I think people know this thing, but uh, in in reality, uh, sometimes uh, uh, we we may feel that if we don't go with the flow, okay, we might be left out or something. If we, for example, the party supports uh, A. So if he does not support A, he may be kicked out of the party or something like that. Um, okay. Um, but I think um, as someone uh, who is a critical, critical thinker, I, I, I don't consider myself as a critical thinker myself, uh, but we should uh, strive to, um, if you believe in something, uh, we we proceed with that, you know, uh, whatever the situation uh, uh, may be. And sometimes it's easier said than done. Okay, uh, easier said than done. Um, so there are many factors that may um, that may um, lead us to not hold on to our uh, belief. Um, so particular thing is not just mere uh, negative criticism. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so if we if we uh, if we don't think critically, so the key here is blind blindly. So we, we just blindly believe uh, whatever that we are told, um, whatever that that we are shown. So if we just blindly believe, if the if that person uses persuasive language, okay, we have a look at this uh, in the last two weeks, uh, using persuasive language and we, we believe in that because that person is very persuasive, not because of uh, the facts that has been presented. So we are not uh, thinking critically. Okay? Um, so don't rush into making decisions. I think we if the decision affects uh, our future, affects the, the future of the nation, uh, for example, it needs to be uh, done in a very objective way. Okay. So if you just blindly believe whatever that we are told, so this leads to things such as forwarding unverified messages via social media, so in the belief that the person that forwarded to us has already checked the facts or the person is a is a good person. So somebody who has a good behavior, okay, a person's behavior does not necessarily correlate with providing truthful information. Okay. Uh, a really pious person may, gi may give us false information uh maybe because he's not a knowledgeable person in in a particular issue okay a pious person does not equate a uh, um, does not necessarily equate an intelligent person or an all-knowing person okay? uh, sometimes we believe in, in someone because she's pious because his uh, his behavior is good but um I think uh, that's not necessarily the case. We need to look at the facts uh, and not just believe in someone because he's a nice person. Okay. Um, so if we do that, it's, it's, it's something that we are blindly 
accepting whatever that that the, the person uh, uh, tell us. And it does not mean that that person is uh, wants to lie to us okay, uh, intentionally. He may that person may do it unintentionally. Uh, he may not know that that is the thing that he did not know. Okay. Um, so we, as the person who listen, who accepts those information, needs to uh, check the facts. Okay. Mm. Uh, ambiguity. So in the end, if we do not agree uh, with somebody or we do not agree with an idea, so in the end we may uh, want to agree to disagree. Okay. Something may can be interpreted in more than one way. Okay. It is not like if you are not with us, you are against us. So. Um, an issue may be looked at in in several perspectives. So not just one to three perspectives. So there, there may be more uh, than one perspective of looking into something. So if you view it in a part, if you look at the issue in a particular perspective, uh, so it, it it may be the truth. Okay? If, you, if you view it in a different perspective uh, of the same issue, okay. So it is based on that particular. Uh, perspective or maybe assumption that, that come with that perspective. Mm -hmm. And we must be um, open to see an issue from another person's point of view, uh, like I mentioned before, perspective. So to try to understand their, their understanding of things, try to understand um, how 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 does it felt like being in their shoes? Okay. Um, that person may be may be right. Okay. We may be um, uh, arrogant that we do not want to understand or we do not want to listen to that person's view. But uh, if you are our future uh, our future uh, member of parliament, okay, for example. Um, I think this is one skill that um, any member of parliament needs to have. So seeing an issue from another person's point of view. Okay. Um, and yeah. So what you seek by thinking critically is um, you want whatever information that is fed to you are uh, reliable information. Okay. Information that is uh, uh, information that is the the truth. Okay. So because we want to make decisions, okay, we want to uh, we want to we want to decide on something okay uh, so we do not want to make decisions or take action based on unverified news unverified articles and things like that uh, based on uh, comments uh, okay uh, comments that people make on social media for example so um, we need to strive for uh, taking reliable information So these five things are uh, what we call the uh, okay. For when when we uh, ask uh, lecture, okay, when we want to prepare a uh, question for final exam, okay. So the questions uh, need to be related to any of these five uh, levels. Okay. So comprehension, comprehension is the, the basic the basic level. Okay. So undergraduate students and postgraduate students have the expected level of questions that we need to prepare. 
uh, for example, those in the uh, postgraduate study, the questions are, uh, may involve uh, the level of synthesizing information and also evaluating uh, evaluating uh, something. For undergraduate students, we um, the maximum or the highest level that we may go is maybe around uh, the analysis um, analysis level. Okay, so you can Google uh, this Bloom. It's called Bloom Bloom Taxonomy. So it's the level of uh, questions, uh, uh, level of questioning. Okay, uh, uh, how 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 involved is the uh, the, the level of question? Mm. Okay, problem solving. Mm. Okay, we're talking about problem solving. When um, uh, when Bill Gates was in the, in in high school, uh, I think I'm not sure in the high school or um, he was asked by his principal to prepare uh, the class schedule. This class schedule for the entire for the entire school. So at, at that time, uh, the school uh, two schools were combined into one. Okay, so using a program, uh, he needs he needs to write a, a program that um, that would assign you know students to to classes. Okay. Uh, so there are many uh, constraints that they need to overcome. For example, uh, one uh, a particular student needs to take physics in order to graduate. For example, and um, this uh, person A cannot be in the same class as this person B. So those are uh, examples of restrictions that Bill and his senior uh, were tasked by uh, the principal of the school. In order to prepare the, the the class the schedule for the entire school, and in the end he managed to to do that. Uh, um, I think right before the school um, the school starts. So, um, so that is an uh, example of um, uh, problem solving. So for. Um, we will learn about problem solving uh, later. This is uh, one of the uh, future topics as well. Um, so if you are, if you read a lot, then you are exposed to a lot of things. Uh, you may have um, um, many perspective in order to solve uh, certain problems. Okay, okay being independent. So think. So it, it allows us to make our own decision, okay, even though it's not uh, with the flow. Okay, for example, it's not it's not mainstream. Uh, so it's different from anyone else, or we are the minority. But if you really think, if you really believe, based on the process that you have gone through, this is what you need to do, or this is what you need to believe. Um, I think um, you need to follow um, to follow the decision that you have made. Okay. Um, of course, once we have made a decision, it does not mean that we need to stick with the decision forever. Okay. Um, people uh, over the years, people change okay, how they think, how they perceive things. So whatever that we decide now, uh, we may have a different uh, opinion uh, uh, later. 
on in our lives. Okay, for example, maybe uh, previously uh, we are someone who believes that the earth is flat, and now after uh, doing the research, uh, we no longer believe that. So it's it's uh, it's not. Is 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 not a sin to, to change our to change our view on something. Mm. So, so there are things that prevents us to think critically. Okay, uh, lack of information, so lack of knowledge. So if you don't um, have the necessary knowledge in order to solve the problem. Um, so that is uh, a barrier. Okay? Um, so, so in order to think critically, we need to be equipped with uh, all the relevant um, information pertaining to a particular issue that we that we want to decide on. Okay? Uh, we may have certain biases. So before we make a decision, we, we actually have already made the decision because we are we are biased. Okay, to certain uh, view, okay, for example. Um, so we maybe want to save our face, okay, not taking certain actions because uh, it's humiliating or it's uh, it's not uh, something that is mainstream, okay, uh, or it is something that is totally different, okay. Uh, so we are hesitant to change. Uh, so we, we are afraid that if we uh, change the if you change the flow or change um, if you make changes you know it, it will be bad or something really bad will happen uh, to us uh, in the future so yeah so um, uh, yeah. So that's just. Um, so we may uh, touch on critical thinking again uh, maybe later. But, but, um, but do you have any know, uh, any questions you'd like to ask uh, before we uh, before we move on with your presentation? Uh, hello, hello, doctor. Can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh. So, talking about uh, creativity, right? Uh, I just want an opinion from doctor lah. Um. How can we actually encourage someone to think creatively? Because um, to me, I think creativity is not easy to nurture or to learn to have. So how can we encourage that to have to learn that? Did you okay. get my question? Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for the question. Okay. Um, I think I uh, partly agree with you that creativity um, is something that is uh, maybe difficult to. Um, difficult to teach okay? um, but it involves uh, imagination okay? it involves um, uh, how we how we think how we perceive things okay? if you if you like to see things uh, differently if you like to uh, think outside of the box okay? so that may lead to um, some form of uh, creativity I, I guess. Uh, I myself, I, I don't consider myself as a creative person, um, so uh, I I may not be the right person to um, to answer this question because I don't think I'm a creative person. But but I think but I have a friend okay who who likes to think um, out of the box, um, that thinks something that I I I never thought of. So I think uh, I think in order to think creatively, you need to to um, 
to expose yourself to um, to different things, uh, maybe by by reading, by by seeing more things, by going, uh, for example, if you are just um, uh, your whole life is in Kuala Lumpur, for example, then you may one uh, once in a while go to a um, suburban area or go to the village just to expand, just to expand our, our view on things. I think why we are not uh, being creative because we are just um, we we are afraid to experiment on things. We just we take things for granted. We have this uh, this knowledge and we think that that's that's enough. So we do, we don't want to explore uh, more things. Um, I think the key uh, maybe is to to try to see th uh, things differently and how how to do that on uh, i'm not really uh, sure about that but uh, i think you know, one of the ways that you can do that maybe um, through reading okay, uh, through, um, uh, even traveling uh, see different places different places okay, uh, um, yeah uh, things like that Try to um, what's that word? Um, go outside of our comfort zone. Yeah, uh, so go outside of our comfort comfort zone. Uh, so that may lead to things that we uh, never thought of. So it it, it may lead to uh, uh, creativity. Uh, yeah, that's. I hope I answered your question. <clears throat> okay, um, any, so any other question? <coughs> so if there's no question, so we have twelve talks today. Um, so each talk, we are given uh, five minutes. Okay, so the uh, first one up is uh, first one up is Islam by Hadif uh, Ile and Amir Atala. So each um, each presenter uh, is assigned a question, uh, at least two questions. So we have Islam for Guan Po needs to ask. Uh, Design after the presentation, Muni wants to ask Hadi after the presentation, and so on. Um, so, uh, Design, if you are ready, um, the title of your talk is My Android Home Screen Setup. So, you can start whenever, whenever you're ready. So, only five minutes. So, do you have slides or things like that? Uh, Dr. Jack, can I start now? Yeah. Uh, okay. If you if you hear like noises like this, it means that you only have like uh, you only have one minute within. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, you may start. Okay. Let me set up my camera. Okay. Uh, can you hear? Can you see me, Doctor? Oh uh, yeah. Okay. So. Um, hello everyone. Uh, hello to Dr. Good afternoon. So uh, as you'll know, to, today I'm going to talk about my Android home screen setup. So without further ado, I'm going to share my home screen uh, by sharing my screen, my phone screen. So let me... So, okay, this is my uh, phone. So as you can see, um, can you see my? Oh, okay, 
It's loading. Okay, so this is my home screen setup. So as you can see, um, it's very minimal. Uh, first of all, um, you can see that uh, at the top, I have the at a glance widget by Google. So I chose this widget because, uh, well, it looks like what pixels have on their home screen widget and I'm not using a pixel. So I decided to put that just to mimic a pixel. And, and below that, we have uh, the Google uh, search bar where I put it there because as you can see for my webcam here, when I hold it like this, I can only reach it until here uh, without straining my finger. So it's just, it's a bit, uh, so it's better to hit it here. And besides that, there's the uh, prayer time. As you can see, uh, 4.22 is uh, the ASA time prayer at my hometown. And below, the, below that are the two rows of apps that I have which the first row are the, uh, as I call the essential apps. And below that is what I call the everyday apps. Um, the, the cool thing about my home screen setup is that I chose, uh, it's not just the stock launcher that I'm using on my phone. I'm actually using a launcher made by Microsoft called Microsoft Launcher. And the unique thing is that when you, when you swipe up from the dock here, from the, uh, the lowest bar of apps here, you can see that it actually reveals another two more Vogue apps that no other launcher gives that for free. So below that, we have the education apps, uh, which are Teams, Modal, Telegram, and so on. And below that are just those frequently used apps that I just don't put on the home screen because uh, I just prefer it to be, to be as minimal like this. So we have like Google Photos, Discord, Drive, and so on. Uh, I don't have I don't have like the home screen on this side, um, but Microsoft Launcher gives like a widget side on here, which I've put my calendar schedule, my Google task, my screen time, and my dashboard. So I think that's all. Yeah, I think that's all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Islam, for sharing us your. Android, uh, home screen. So, uh, Guanpo, it's up to you to ask. Uh, add these three questions to you. The first question I'd like to ask is, where do you get all this? Where, where do you find the resources for all those widgets and themes that you use? And where do you get the inspiration from? Okay, um, for the first question, the widgets, like I said, like I'm only uh, using, as you can see, three widgets. This, the top one is the Google, as the Google at a glance widget, where if you install the Google app in on your phone, you will have it. So as you can see, if I try to add a widget, you scroll to the Google, and then there's the at a glance widget. So you just hold it and there it is. Simple as that. For the Google search bar, uh, it's the same just like before uh, given by Google. You just search it and then there's the Google search bar. Here it is, Google search. And then my Asa Player is also from the widget. So it's from Muslim Pro. So here it is, uh, the first one here. So. And for the inspiration, basically, um, I've been uh, changing my own scheme a lot, but um, at the end, I just wanted something that resembles a pixel, but also something that everything that I need to touch is all within my hand. So as you can see with the webcam here, like everything that I need to touch is within my, feet, my thumb here, and everything else is uh, above where I can't reach is just information that I don't need to touch. And if I need to swipe for the for the location, Microsoft Launcher has that gesture where I can just swipe up here and it will reveal the notification. And if you just swipe up from anywhere, it will reveal the dock and that's it. So yeah. Thank you yeah. for the question. So so the widgets are built in, is it? Um yeah. for for the widgets that I use, um you have to download 
uh, for the player, you have to download the Muslim Pro app, and for the other two widgets, you have to download the Google app. And for the for the launcher that I'm using, you have to download Microsoft Launcher from the Play Store, because this is not the stock launcher that my phone has. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Garpo, for the question. Um, so anyone else has any question to ask? Uh, I, I do have a question. Uh, um, how, how, how large is the storage of the phone? Uh, I chose the 128 gig variant for my phone. And right now, I only have 40% storage left. Okay, so so you, you only have like minimal apps on your phone, or or do the apps actually consume a lot of space, or um, or do you have actually the, have more apps than the one that you have? Uh, the the mo the the stuff that mostly takes my storage are my music my music storage and the games that I downloaded. Uh, I, I, can, I can show you how much it takes. Wait, I'll present it again. So, as you can see, uh, my games are like 21 gigs, and my music is already 7.1 gigs. My photos are 4.2. Too, but most of them I should be storing at Google Photos, so it would be interfering with my storage. I don't know how that happens. Uh, my files, yeah, I don't think they're yeah, mostly is for my games and my music, yeah. and I guess some other apps as well. Okay. Yeah. So, what's the model of your phone again? Uh, so uh, what's the mod model of the phone again? Oh, um, I'm using uh, the OnePlus Nord, the 128 gig variant, with 8 gigs of RAM. Mm. So why, why did you not get a Pixel phone or something? Uh, the, uh, the Google Pixel is not officially sold here in Malaysia, while the OnePlus Nord is. And the only, the closest, uh, the closest thing I could get with the Google Pixel is from buying it online from Singapore, and which... Uh, at the time, I really don't want to. I want it like um, where I could have that. Uh, where I could, that one one plus actually uh, sells it officially in Malaysia, so I really I actually want that. Mm. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is it done? Uh, thank you, doctor. So I want everyone to go to that link. I shared in the chat. Okay, uh, just fill in the, the give us call to it. Uh, there's three questions there that you need to answer. Uh, so the scale of the part um fill in uh, based on what, what you feel. Okay. So I'll give you a minute for you to do that. <laughs> so the next presenter is uh, Hadif. So Hadif is uh, going to talk about what we do. Um, so anytime, are you ready, Hadif? Can you see my screen, Doctor? Uh, yeah. Lights? Uh, yes. All right. Yeah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good afternoon to all my fellow friends. My topic today would be about rugby, and I'll be explaining to you guys about the basic of rugby. 
I chose rugby because it is one of the sports which I have played during my secondary school years. Let's get started. So there are three versions of playing rugby. The first one is the 15 players each side. Next is the 10 players each side and last one is the 7 players each side. For the 15 players side, you could have 7 substitutes on the bench while for the 10 side and the 7 sides, you could have 5 players on the substitute bench. So the most common thing you'll see in rugby is the tackle. Only the ball carrier in rugby could be tackled and the tackle must be below the shoulder level. If the tackle is higher than the shoulder level, it is called a high tackle or a dangerous tackle and the tackler could receive a yellow card or either a red card. So next slide is about the try. Try is one of the method to score points in rugby. So every try, your team will receive five, five points. And in order to do a try, you need to ground the ball on, into inside the opponent's uh, in goal line. After the try, your team needs to take the conversion. Only one kicker needs to kick the ball <coughs> inside the goal post. And if you successfully kick the ball into the goal post, your team will receive another two points for the game. So other ways to score points in rugby is by doing a drop goal or also a penalty kick. Both of these will give you will give the team three points respectively. So what is a drop goal? Drop goal is basically when the ball is in in play, when the ball is in play. One of the players drop the ball and immediately kick the ball inside the goalpost. And for penalty kick, it is almost similar to the conversion, but it happens when the opponent's team commit a serious foul play and your team gets rewarded a penalty. In rugby, the ball must be passed backwards. You cannot pass the ball forwards. If you accidentally pass the ball forwards, the other team would get a scrum. In the next slide, I will explain more about the scrum. So this is the scrum, as you guys can see on the slide. So scrum is a restarting play after a minor infringement. Eight players binds together with the opposing team. And the team with advantage will feed the ball into the scrum. And the aim of the scrum is to, to compete for the ball in order to win possession. And I'll be sharing to you guys about the lineup. The lineup is also a restarting play after, after the ball when uh, the team that doesn't touch the ball last will get to throw the ball in and the team will lift a player in the air in order to fight for the ball. So before I end my presentation, Uh, I will like end number number forty nine in the world rugby ranking. Really strong rugby team, especially for the rugby seven side team. That is all from me. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you uh, okay, uh, Hadif. Yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, just wondering, have you ever joined rugby events before, like in school or? In oh, my experience, or did I join any competitions like that? Ah, uh, yes, that's why. Oh, yeah, I did join competition during my during in when I was in form three and form four. Uh, we joined the invitational Samsas rugby, and in that competition, uh, my team managed to get a runner up in plate plate division. Ah, okay. Any more questions, Bune? Mm, so, do you have any? Uh, do, you, do you ever plan you no know, to you know, to continue play rugby in the future? Uh, actually, uh, I dream of playing more rugby in the future, but because I had uh, injuries on my knee, I decided to stop playing rugby. Uh -huh. 
I see. So, uh, yeah, uh, best of luck to you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, Hadif, uh, you got your injury while playing rugby, right? Sorry, that thing? You got the injury uh, due to playing rugby? Uh, yes, I got the injury when I joined a competition during Form 4 and it, it, it didn't hurt my knee that bad, but it leaves like some, what do you call, some marks. I cannot like play, sit, like, I cannot play sports such as rugby anymore, but I can do sports, but not rugby anymore. Okay, that uh, I do play badminton, but I'm not that good. I play futsal, soccer. Okay. But, uh, okay, um, thank you, um, Hadi. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, again, uh, guys, uh, fit in the same link. Uh, uh, fit in the same link uh, and uh, provide a score to each of the three criteria there. Uh, okay, uh, so next up is Ile. Um, so Ile is going to present next, and Afik is going to ask the question. Okay, Ile, uh, whenever you're ready, you can start. I can see the slide. I think your voice may uh, not be clear. Uh, yeah, you can start. Uh, whenever, whenever you're ready, you can start. So I'm in NMT. I'm going to present the topic about used face masks for the environment. Okay, today I'm going to cover two topics, which is how used face masks damage our environment. Okay, there are two things. First is land pollution. Due to lack of rubbish bins, people might throw their face masks in unnecessary places without knowing the consequences to the environment. And second is it can harm land and marine habitat. As you can see the image above, there is a ear straps or the ear loops is stuck with the habitat's body, which might endanger their life. Second is the solutions to prevent the nature from being damaged. There are three solutions I include here. The first one is use reusable face mask. As we all know that we can use two type of masks, which is the reusable face mask and the surgical mask. First, the reusable face mask. 
which is the washable triple layer reusable cloth which we have which we need to wash it and we need to completely dry after we before we use before we use it second is the surgical mask and i'm here include that how to dispose it properly we first we need to fold it like a rolls and then tie the ear, ear loops and then wrap it in a plastic paper to dispose it in a recycle bins second thing third thing is the creating awareness like campaign poster even social posting in a social media is very helpful to convey any information in a faster way here i'm include one short video on how to dispose our face mask in a proper way hope you enjoy Can you see that? Yeah, I, I can't see the video. Okay, I'm trying. Can you show me the video? So you have about a minute. Yeah, you have about a minute to go. Sorry, I think it keep running. So I can show you. Thank you. Okay, so we finish. Um Okay, um, so I'll fit. Okay, hi, hello, Hello. Um, so I'm just wondering, I'm wondering two things. The first one is, I saw a post in social media about the bird feet uh, get tied by the mask, the mask, and I'm just wondering, is it, a true story or it's just a made up story and then the second question is I'm wondering does throwing away mask actually help in decreasing the pollution because end up it still went to it still go to the landfill right so yeah that's the question is it a first question actually it is a true story as I uh Insert one picture about the bird which was struggling with the you know, the face mask, your stra elastic straps. Actually, it's a true story which it cannot uh, uh, survive with it. And the second thing is, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Uh, this the second one is, uh, is how does throwing the mask can help to reduce the pollution? You 
use the pollutions. Okay. Um, because uh, throwing mask can cause many types of pollution, as I include my in my slide. Uh, actually, it uh, it reduces the air pollution because the bacteria might spread all over the way if we dispose it improper way. If we proper if if we dispose it in a proper way, we definitely can reduce the air pollution and other pollutions too. Thank you. Okay, thank you for answering. Okay, Ili, I have a question. Uh, you said uh, uh, the mask needs to be thrown in a recycle bin, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but uh, surgical face masks actually recyclable? Can those uh, surgical masks be recycled? Mm -hmm. Actually, Actually, I want to be clear that why we have two types of masks, which is the surgical mask and the reusable uh, mask. And when I do my slides, I got uh, I got again knowledge that we should not uh, we should not throw our surgical mask in a recycled bin because it might cause pollution too. Mm. Let me go back to the slide one one slide back. Yeah, it's, actually, it's my mistake. Yeah, I correct it. Okay. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, because I saw that. Yeah, no, okay. Uh, yeah, so the face masks are not recycled. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lily, uh, for you. the talk. <coughs> um, uh, so, again, uh, go to the same link. Uh, okay. uh, go to the same link and give a score to e-late. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. um. Right, uh, next up is Hazik. Hazik is going to talk about Messi versus Ronaldo. And uh, Faiz is going to ask the question. Okay, uh, Hazik, uh, whenever you're ready, you can... Oh, doctor, can you hear me? Can you see me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Right, excellent. Uh, <laughs> let me share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yeah, yeah. Mm. All right. Uh, so, let me start. So, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good day. I be to Dr. Reza and my friend, fellow friends. So, my name is Karyo Hazik and today I will be presenting about Messi versus Ronaldo. So, uh, I'm going to introduce Messi to you if you don't know who he is. So his full name is Lionel Andres Messi. He was born on 24th of June 1987 in Rosario, Argentina. And at, as a kid, he was diagnosed with GHD, which is a uh, growth hormone deficiency. So his growth was stunted. He could not grow as well as his friends. So that explains his height. Uh, so now we go on to his football journey. So his first club was Newell's Old Boys, and at the age of 13, he went to FC Barcelona, and right now, he is still playing for them. So now, uh, and I'm going to introduce Ronaldo. So his full name is Cristiano Ronaldo dos Santos Aveiro, born on 5th of February, 1985. Uh, he was born in Funchal, Portugal, and as a teenager, he had <coughs> a, a heart problem, which is a racing heart. Uh, so he could not play football for a year. So he had to overcome that with a heart surgery. Now we go on to his senior football journey. Uh, he started his career at Sporting CP and then he was scouted at Manchester United. And then he became a legend at Real Madrid. And now he's currently playing at Juventus in Italy. So Messi and Ronaldo have played um, a series of games against each other. They have played a series of 35 games together against each other and Messi has come up on top and won 16 of them while Ronaldo has won 10 and they've drawn nine times while Messi has 22 goals uh, and Ronaldo has 19 goals right so I'm going to talk about Messi's individual uh, main individual trophies uh, because the, both of them have tons of trophies they, you could make a book out of it so uh, I will talk about the main one so Messi has the most uh, awards of Balloon d'Or. He has six Balloon d'Ors and currently uh, the most 
the most that the ever player ever, a player ever gotten. Uh, he has won four Champions League with Barcelona, and for Argentina, he has won the Under 20 World Cup champion, and uh, he is also a Olympic gold medalist. So uh, for Ronaldo, on the other hand, he has won five Balloon d'Ors, and he has won uh, one more Champions League. Uh, he has won five Champions League. Uh, with two separate teams, which is Real Madrid and Manchester United. And for Portugal, he won the Euros in 2016. And last year, uh, recently, he won the UEFA Nations League with Portugal. So what can we learn from Messi? So as we all know, uh, Messi is an introverted person. So he is also a, a very loyal person. He has spent 20 years at the club and still on go and still ongoing. He, he also has no controversies whatsoever on and off the pitch. And he is a great player overall. So, on the other hand, what can we learn from Ronaldo? So, Ronaldo uh, is an extroverted person. He is the symbol of a never-give-up spirit. He always tells us to always believe in ourselves. So, like Ronaldo, uh, we need to be like a chameleon. Anywhere we go, we will win. We will succeed. Like Ronaldo, anywhere he goes, he will win trophies for the team. So uh, the most important thing is his leadership skills. So uh, he is very, uh, is a very good leader for his country and his team. So what is happening now to both of them? So now we are approaching an end of an era for these two of the greatest footballers who ever graced the field. So I believe they have, uh, they got more, a few more years in them. So, World Cup 2022 might be the last World Cup for them. Messi will be 35 and Ronaldo will be 37 by then. So, uh, we hope to see them uh, perform well. So, uh, these are the some rumours that came up. So, Messi might be transferring from Barcelona to Manchester City. And Ronaldo might be coming back to Manchester United. So, we might see the rivalry uh, of these two greatest of all times so, uh, against each other again. So, uh, as a conclusion, who is the greatest of all time? In my opinion, uh, it is Lionel Messi because he has more contributions uh, in goal and for his team. But uh, no matter whether you support Messi or Ronaldo, they are just the higher representation of introverts and extroverts. So, you can be successful as long as you put in the work, no matter if you're introvert or extrovert. Uh, so, with that, I end my talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hazik, for the energy talk. Uh, uh, I give you a to ask uh, this um, Hazik, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay. So I have two questions, which right. is, um, just like you said just now, you see rumored to move up from Barcelona, right? Yeah. So I need. I want to know why he he wants to move out from Barcelona after all those years, like twenty okay. years. That's that's a lot. Okay. And then um, the second question. Uh, I don't. I I don't mind if you don't have answer for this, but I'm just wondering. Um, mm. So who is? I'm wondering who is the CR Junior's mother. <laughs> Oh, that's from me. <laughs> you to do with the information. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, so thank you for the question, Faiz. Uh, so for the first question, why Lionel Messi uh, wants to move uh, to another team, to Man City, is because uh, recently in his uh, latest interview, he is very unhappy right now with uh, the Barcelona board. So uh, he's the main reason is he is very unhappy and wants to wants a new challenge, wants to take on a new challenge. And for the second question, uh, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo doesn't have any wife, but he has kids. Uh, so he has multiple girlfriends. So uh, this right here is uh, Irina Shaik. Irina Shaik, his ex-girlfriend. Right. So this is uh, her, uh, his mother. Right. Hope that's answered the question. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Hazik. Yeah, uh, so far is for the uh, this uh, question. Um, uh, I, 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 honestly, I, I don't have any question uh, for the but uh, very energetic. Uh, uh, interesting. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Doctor. <coughs> um,
Um, so in the meantime, Tim, uh, you can uh, you can get ready. Um, And please uh, use the same link to give and to give as it okay. Okay. Can yeah. you see my slide? Uh, yeah, I can see your screen. Okay. In the meantime, please fill in the Google spreadsheet. In this okay. Yeah, here I can see your uh, uh, so you can start any and everyone. Uh, good day, doctor and everyone. So today, uh, so, uh, doctor, can you hear me? Um, yes, yes, I can do. Mm. Uh, good day, doctor and everyone. So today, I was talking about TikTok and how it captured our generation. So I believe that by now everyone knows what TikTok is and what it does. But let me just give you a bit introduction on what TikTok is. So TikTok, uh, TikTok is a social media platform for creating, sharing and discovering short videos. Usually the videos are from uh, 15 seconds up to 60 seconds. So before I proceed with how uh, TikTok captured our generation, I'll be talking about the stereotypes that we had about about TikTok during the early days it was introduced. So the biggest mindset I had and I think um, most of us had is that TikTok is a place where people post cringy videos. So when I mention cringy videos, I think you guys know which group of people I'm talking about. Uh, it was It's kind of funny because everyone just started assuming that uh, TikTok is full of the rompet kids uh, and their cringy videos. Uh, other than this cringy video stereotype, another thing that we thought, uh, the thought that we had on TikTok was TikTok is a dancing app where the content is all about dance. But then over time, uh, over time, the uh, TikTok broke our mindset and it became like one of the most entertaining app and even turned uh, some of us into TikTok addicts. So. Let's see how uh, TikTok gained people's attention. So in my point of view, I think the main reason why uh, people are drawn to TikTok is because of its ability to provide uh, a great content in a short amount of time. So for example, we were able to see like a comedy, a comedy content that could make us laugh. And also even we were able to see uh, cooking videos where we can learn how to make a certain dish in just a short amount of time. Um, amount of time. So basically, I think uh, through TikTok, uh, people were able to learn a lot of new things in just that one minute video. Uh, next is uh, TikTok complements every aspect. It relates to everything and almost everyone. So as you can see, the uh, the content of TikTok varies. There are a lot of contents. There are skincare contents, fashion, um, sports, movie recommendation, everything. So people uh, get to choose what they want to see. And the last one is, uh, as I told you just now, there are a lot of contents on TikTok. So people are easily they get easily get engaged to our interest, uh, to their interest. So for example, if they are a skincare enthusiast, they can like look up for videos on skincare and uh, get a lot of knowledge on what, what products are good for their skin, what products are not. There are even therapies in there giving out uh, advices on mental health issues for those suffering on mental health. So I think that TikTok is, a, is also a platform for people to like engage to their interests explore their interests and also develop their interests. So I think these three uh, things are the main reason why people nowadays are uh, drawn to TikTok and why it is now all over the place. So I think that's all from me. And those who have not downloaded TikTok yet, I think you guys can give it a try. <laughs> because I'm a TikTok addict now. <laughs> 
thank you tiktok editing um so ada Hello. I hope you guys can hear me. Yeah, you guys hear yeah. Okay. So I have a question regarding like what, like I said, was more on the positive side of TikTok, like informative videos and short videos like that. Uh, and the negative side you thought were just like the cringy videos, right? So what about the more technical negative sides, like um, like no, uh. Uh, I I haven't finished my question. Sorry. Okay, okay. <laughs> like uh like the rumor where the Chinese government is actually using TikTok to like uh get our data and all that. I don't know how true that is, but uh I want to know your view on that. Uh and also like um well being a ad ad an addict is uh. I, I guess it's not good. So because of the short video format of TikTok, would that like increase the chance of someone being addicted? And if that is so, then uh, what are your thoughts on the negative sides and the positive sides? Like which one is outweighs the other one? Okay, uh, for the first question, uh, you said that the negative thing that I only talk about is the cringy videos. Uh, for that, the stereotypes, it was I, uh, for that one, I was talking about the stereotypes we had uh, uh, during the early days. But then I think um, it depends for both of your question. I think it depends on the people. For me, in my opinion, at first I had, I thought that uh, uh, TikTok is like an, a non-educational -educa place where people only post friends, cringy videos and everything. But then when I started like, to go on TikTok during the quarantine times, I, I learned a lot of things. I think that it depends on what you choose to see. If you, if for in my, uh, in my point of view, I choose to see the, I like to see about skincare, about fashion, funny contents. It, it all depends on the individual. All so right. if you choose to see the good things, then you will get the good things. If you choose to see the bad things, of course you'll get the bad things. The same thing for the second one, being an addict. So, yeah, it's a bad thing because every social media, being an addict is a bad thing. But then it also depends on the people. You have to have a self-control. I'm an addict, but not to the point where like, I watch them like 24 hours a day. I have, uh, I only watch like one hour. I don't watch it very often. It depends on the people. You have to have a uh, self-control. I can go and tell people, oh, don't be a, an addict. It depends on them. So that's all. Did, all right. did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Adam, for the question. Uh, uh, Till, are you yourself active on TikTok? Do you yourself make videos? Oh, uh, um, I do make videos. But I don't post on uh, on the TikTok, but I post to my close friends on IG. Yeah, they are my only friends. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you for the talk. Um, <coughs> uh, so again, guys, uh, in the same thing. Uh, <coughs> before the day. And so next up is. <clears throat> Let's start with Azri Anwar and Nepo. So, Nepo will be presenting, and so Azri is presenting, and Azri is also going to ask questions. Nepo is going to be presenting, and Azri is going to Okay, doctor, can you see my screen? Yeah, I can. Can, see can you hear me? Yeah, I can see you with the shark as well. Yeah. Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good evening to doctor and my fellow friends. Today I'm going to talk about sharks. Thanks. Okay, hi, Nepu. And as you can see, I'm wearing a um, um, very fancy, not quite fancy, um, shark filter because I made this on my own. And the one who inspired me to do the talk about shark facts, uh, some not a kind of person, is half human, half shark, and she's a 
VTuber. Her name is Gaugura over here, as you can see. And then let's get into it. Okay. Okay, the introduction. What is a shark actually? Well, sharks are a group type of fish. Yes, a fish, not a bird. <laughs> okay, this is instant shark fact. Okay, shark fact. Uh -huh. Shark can burst speed up to 80 kilometers per hour. Um, do you want to see how fast is that? Um, we can see, uh, we can have a virtual simulation here. Uh, how fast that shark is? Wait, let me see. Zoom, how fast is that? He's zooming, right? <laughs> okay. Um, another fact, sharks do not have bones. Um, their skeletons are made from cartilaginous tissues. And but 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 Nepu, uh, how about the strong jaws in the jaws movie in the movie that eat people, eat metals and something, right? How about it? Is it is it strong enough? Yes, it is strong, but it's still a cartilaginous tissues. Um, their teeth are made from. Um, it's still cartilage, but it's caught by strong enamel and stronger than us human, and it can chomp anything. Um, like tiger shark, it can eat anything, including metal, except sand, I think. So, another fact, most shark skin feels like sandpaper. It is made up of tiny teeth like uh, structures called placoid scales, also known as dermal denticles. So, uh, as you can see here, Mako shark skin has a close-up view, as a, a tiny scales that look like teeth. Uh, it is also it. If you touch it, it feels like sandpaper. But on the other hand, uh, unlike unlike other sharks, the nurse shark skin um actually fairly smooth, and if you cl look close enough, it, it as you may see um a little pores in the skin, and this is another quick shark fact. Actually, most shark need to move to stay alive, but nurse shark can pump the water into their gills. Um, unlike unlike the fishes, shark need to move because they can, don't have to the pump to, to go, let the water go through their skin so, gills. So they need to move Un, unless. Uh, um, but if don't, if they don't don't move, and they will die. So this is conclusion of my. Talk. Um, to conclude this, um, a shark can zoom up to 80 kilometers per hour. And shark do not have bones, only cartilages. Um, most shark skin feel like sandpaper. And most shark need to, to move to stay alive. And nurse shark are built different. To conclude, uh, to end this, uh, I will share to my filter, um, Snapchat filter, you can use it on Snapcam. And Snapchat, maybe later on I will put it on Instagram, maybe if I'm not lazy enough. So any question? That's all from me. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Azri. Hello, Nepo, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, for my first question, uh, how many is there shark species exist? Um, <laughs> As I search on Google, um, doing my doing some slides, and uh, I think around five hundred species of sharks that live in the under the water. And for the second question, what is the common sharks that exist? So the most common shark that all people know are the great white shark. Um, this is because um, great white shark actually the apex predator. And the great white shark, uh, mostly on the movies, like you can see the Jaws and the Jaws movie. And um, some say that Megalodon is also um, a great white shark. Um, yeah, it appears on the movie The Mac also. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Matthew, for the interesting talk. Um, I'm just curious, uh, if you compare a cheetah with a shark, so who, who is faster? Um, I think cheetah is more faster because um, a shark, although they can speed up in on up, up to 80 kilometers per hour, um, they, say they only can travel not that fast, eh, not that long, because um, a shark, 
only can travel 80 km per day. So if they use all their energy, um, maybe they, can, they will slow down and cheetah can move really fast and can, I think, can travel more than 80 km per day. Okay. Um, so have you yourself uh, ever touched in, uh, the skin of the shark? <laughs> Sadly not yet. I, I hope I want to touch a shark someday. Okay. Right. Uh, and also, when can you get the ID filter from you? <laughs> the filter is on Snapcam, but the ID filter, I'm not done it yet. So maybe I will let, update later on. Okay. Right. Uh, thank you, Matthew, for the presentation. Uh, um, thank you. <laughs> So, now I see questions of photos that I have seen. Okay, again. Okay, in the same way. Okay, in the same way. AI refers to the simulation of human intelligence by the means of programming them to think like humans and mimic their actions. This brings rise to almost creepy features, I'd say, in the simplest of things like text predictions that aim to sound the way we supposedly uniquely do as humans. Especially for us Malaysians, since we tend to use uh, in the English MLA language interchangeably, it's quite amazing that the key our keyboard is able to still take that into consideration. So, it's no secret that AI has become a huge part of our everyday life. And it's almost everywhere, whether we notice that we're using it or not. As previously stated, from text predictions, Google predictive searches that we use every single day, to more bold uh, developments that aim to test the limits of AI and make further advancements, such as with the rise of self-driving cars and video forgery with deepfake. Now, with all that in mind, you start to think so much has been accomplished and has become so easily accessible, only getting better with our continuous use and over time. So where could we possibly go from now? As for me, my mind wanders off to the fictional side of things because I love sci-fi. So I'd first like to give a warning of a minor spoiler alert as I begin to talk about one of my favorite series, Black Mirror. One of their episodes titled Be Right Back illustrates the concept of artificially bringing back life from the dead by using previously recorded data to mimic mannerisms of the disease through an android. Two trains of thought here would be, whoa, that's pretty cool. But a second would be, that's very creepy. A more interesting thing to look at here though, is that something fictional like this could actually be brought to our real life. From this episode itself, uh, an AI startup called Luca Chat was partially inspired and developed, allowing users to speak to their deceased contacts through an AI. It takes an actual message sent by the deceased while they were still alive and generates realistic conversations mimicking, mimicking their personality. So for example, here we have an example of Prince to, uh, as a celebrity contact. 
the previous example depicts that the bridge between what used to be fiction and reality is slowly diminishing in the world of AI. What we have now enables to build really powerful AI with the likes of GPT-3 or a generative pre-trained transformer tree that takes a step closer to being a general use AI. We have Spark, the Boston Dynamics dog that challenges the future of robotics. What we, what we once could only imagine now goes beyond our imagination. Bizarre questions we may have may, may end up Bizarre questions we had may end up a reality such as, will AI be better than humans? Or one for all my brothers out there who constantly think it. Can we get AI girlfriends? Well, the scary answer there is we're taking a step closer towards that every single day. That's how powerful, that's how powerful and uh, potential the uh, future of AI is. So as my takeaway, we now see that the vast we now see the vast potential of future AI. Development of such is not something that we should restrict as we aim to uncover and develop more possible solutions to rising world problems. However, precautions should be taken as to not cross legal boundaries or nor to reach the state of destructive or harmful AI used in war in wars, for example. A robot takeover that we all once feared all of a sudden suddenly seems like really possible. So as we the we as the humans developing in them should ensure that they are under control. So that is all from me. Thank you for listening to my talk. Beautiful slide you have there, Naim. So, oh, thank you. my first question is if there is an AI girlfriend, would you try to date it? And then, I wouldn't. my second. <laughs> can you, did you get my first question? Yeah. Oh, uh, and then, uh, for my second question, uh, do you have any specific project you want to develop using AI in the future? Thank you. So in terms of the first question, I think personally for me, I wouldn't because I still feel the gap of between emotion that a human can portray and in real life and a robot. Because despite how much algorithms you want to put in a robot, I don't think it's possible to emulate proper human emotions, especially when it comes to personal relationships. Yeah, I think that's just very creepy. And for your second questions, in terms of projects of AI, one of my passions is actually AI in medical work. So I was at a young age, I'm not sure when Big Hero 6 came out, but that really caught my attention because I like the concept of having a robot and a part and like a, a very friendly cartoony AI, uh, yeah, cartoony AI that helps to make healthcare much easier and like approachable to especially the younger generation. So yeah. Question. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so I have a question for you. Uh, thank you. And so, <clears throat> what do you think of um, the rise of AI and also the and the claims that AI uh, is stealing people's jobs in the future? Uh, I think that's a subjective topic because, for like I mentioned just now, we have GPT-3 that's on the rise. GPT-3 aims to uh, take text input and basically perform almost like almost like almost most things that a human can do. Like someone even tried to, uh, in, like I think they put in parameters to build a machine learning model that GPT-3 was able to build. So that was basically getting an AI to build AI. So I would say that to some point, it is able to over uh, to replace a lot of jobs, but then we come to the emotional side that they are unable to replicate. So jobs such as uh, in psychology or medicine, I don't think they can fully replace those kind of jobs, but then it comes down to also human control in order to in order not to result in a robot takeover. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, in your slide, you mentioned about the card chat. Uh, have, yep. you actually tried, have you actually tried this program? No, I haven't, but it does look interesting, but it's creepy at the same time. I, I wouldn't want to imagine someone who 
isn't physically here anymore, like but still being able to communicate like exactly how they would communicate, you know. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Talk. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so again, so that's the link to give. Uh, this is cool. This is not the right? Uh, okay. Next up is Haika. <coughs> so Haika uh, is going to talk about pineapple could be a pizza. And Marsa, uh, Marsa is going to ask the question. So hi Carl, whenever you're ready, start. <coughs> so your microphone will switch off. Um, you ready? Okay, sorry. So can you see my face and the screen now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, Assalamualaikum and a very good um, evening to Dr. Reza and other friends. My name is Muhammad Haika Ben Sharudin, um, and today I will be presenting on a topic on why pineapple should be on pizza. So let's get started. So the history of uh, a pineapple pizza is actually the origin of a Hawaiian pizza which is um, a cheese pizza with ham back in uh, 1962. So the debate started to heat up on January of 2017. It started when a guy had tweeted on his Twitter about um, this. Was popping Twitter retweet to ruin a pineapple on pizza haters timeline. So obviously this um, is a uh, you can see it's a lot of it's too much of a pineapple on a pizza, but we get the idea of how and when it started. It, the debate started. Okay, so um, as a pineapple on a pizza lover, I shall now start or start explaining on why pineapple does belong to pizza. So the first point is about balance. As we know, when we eat pizza, um, as we know pizza has a salty and heavy taste. Meanwhile, pineapple has a sweet and juicy um, taste um, from it. So um, think of it uh, as a two phases of eating processes, which is the first is when you eat the pizza alone, we taste the, the salty and heavy taste. And then the second phase is where the pineapple comes in. So you can, uh, you, can feel, you can taste the sweet and juicy taste of pineapple that we cut through the heavy taste of, from the pizza. And second, the health benefits. Uh, as you know, um, pineapple is uh, a tropical fruit, and we know fruit has a lot of benefits in it. So specifically for pineapple, it is rich in vitamin C, potassium, and also fiber, which mainly helps with our blood pressure, digestion, and also boosts our immunity. So a bit um, a reminder for you all, you can hate on topping pizza with something that actually is good for your health. Okay, point number three is the variety of choice. It is actually a freedom for us to pick toppings because as we know, um, we can choose a lot of toppings um, for our pizza. And from my um, point of view, um, pineapple is not seen as a problem because the intention, um, the creation of a pineapple pizza is never to, um, the invention, the in it is intended not to gross people out, but instead it gives um, people more choices. So uh, I would like to take you all a step back, and you know, because we are, um, because I'm talking about variety of choice, um, what about this? If we can have a boba on an instant noodle, why can't we have pineapple on a pizza? Okay. Moving on to number four, fruits do not belong on pizza argument. A lot of people argue that fruits do not actually belong um, on pizza. Um, that's when they think uh, they are winning, but actually they are not because I have a fact that is tomato, which is which is the base sauce for the pizza, is actually a fruit. And on top of that, I have also another um, thing to add here, which is olives. 
there is actually a fruit too. So I believe with these two points, um, it could it has defeat the logic from uh, this argument. So in conclusion, there are lots of reasons why pineapple does belong on pizza. But um, my main points that I stated earlier are because of its balance, the the benefits, the freedom of choices, and also the argument of um, fruits that don't belong to uh, pizza. Um, so uh, to all the pineapple pizza uh, lovers out there, I would say that I have your back, so don't worry about me. With that, I end my speech. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I can't for the talk. Um, <coughs> Marsa, uh, please ask uh, Hi a couple yeah. of questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, my first question is, uh, besides pineapple, do you have any other toppings on pizza that you like, uh, but people seem to hate them? Besides pineapple, and my second question is, uh, is there anything you want to say to the pineapple on pizza haters? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Yeah. So for question number one, um, other than pineapple, um, as far as I know from my experience of life, I don't think there is another there is other toppings that I like than that other people hate it because. Um, Usually we eat the same pizza and we don't argue um, a lot about it. For the second question, um, sorry, can you repeat the second question? Yeah, is there anything you want to say oh, okay. um, to the pizza on pine uh, pineapple on pizza haters? Okay, for the haters out there, <laughs> uh, I would say you should give um, pineapple another chance uh, because I've read. And during my research about this topic, I read that um, one of the reasons that people don't like pineapple on pizza is because yeah, they are eating the pizza. I mean, the, it's not the correct way to serve the pizza, to serve the pineapple on pizza. So that is that is the one of the reasons why they hate it. So yeah, that's all. Okay. Uh, thank you, Marissa, for the question. Okay, I have a uh, uh, question to you, uh, So if there's no pineapple on the pizza, so you, you won't you won't eat it. Um, so no, it uh, I would still eat it because um, I for my opinion um, I think the best way to eat pizza is by enjoying the the food itself, by not complaining anything, because um, there's no fun in it. So the best way to eat it, I think, is just take it all. Okay. So your your favorite place to, to get your pizza? Um, Domino's. Domino's. Okay. Yeah. Those free advertising. Okay. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Thank you, Haika. Uh, for the talk. Uh, what kind of things? Uh, okay. Next is uh, Kevin. Um, Kevin will be talking about AMD versus Intel, and Akram is going to ask the questions. And so, you please use the same link uh, to give Akram uh, the score. Right? You use the same link, uh, Google Forms link, to give Akram the score. Uh, Kevin, so whenever you're ready, you can start. Uh, hello, doctor. Can you see my screen? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good uh, afternoon, everyone. My name is Kaifan Prasan Afif and I'm going to talk about AMD versus Intel. First, uh, I'm going to talk about AMD. First. Uh, what? Uh, who is AMD? AMD or Advanced Micro Device Incorporation is a company semiconductor company that develop a computer, uh, microprocessor, and related technology uh, to support business and even 
for a consumer market. Mainly its product uh, is microprocessor, motherboard chipset, embedded processor, and graphics processor. Uh, first, it was incorporated by Jerry Sanders, a semiconductor uh, from Fairchild uh, Semiconductor Industry on 1st uh, May 1969, along with uh, his other seven colleagues, also from Fairchild uh, Semiconductor Industry. And one of the most important thing is on 24 July 2006, AMD announced its acquisition of ATI Technologies. ATI Technologies is a graphic processor manufacturer and AMD start an initiative called Fusion to integrate CPU and GPU together in the one chip. Uh, at one point, uh, this integration is important and have a, a major impact on, especially on laptop, because by using a, an APU, the Fusion later called APU or Accelerated Processing Unit, uh, it gives the laptop a major advantage, uh, not only in performance, but also in power efficiency. And then next, I'm going to talk about Intel. Intel is similar to AMD. It's a also a company that uh, develop and manufacture a uh, microprocessor uh, for computer and other IT related uh, hardware, such as microprocessor and motherboard chipset, network controller, integrated circuit, flash memory like SSD and graphic chips. Uh, it is one of the highest value semiconductor chip manufacturer in terms of revenue in the world and also the developer of the X86 series of microprocessor or that still use the 32 bits uh, operating system. It was founded on 18 July 1968 by Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore with the executive leader Andrew Proof. You may uh, already heard about Gordon Moore's because uh, Moore's law. And in 2019, Intel market share significantly decreased in the enthusiast market and currently facing a delay in their 10 nanometer products uh, because the AMD already uh, surpassed uh, the 10 nanometers product. I will explain uh, later. Okay, here's the graphics uh, in 2000, uh, from 2001 to 2007. This is the graphic that uh, showed the, pass, uh, the Passmark CPU test. Passmark is a software to benchmark, uh, benchmark the processor. In the first uh, year before the 2004, uh, the competitors if really, uh, the gap is really small. But then in 2004, AMD released a new processor, but Intel also catch up in 2005 with the new Pentium. It's in the multi-thread, also in the single thread, it's also the same. Uh, Intel has a uh, major advantage here, uh, a major upper hand, but not that wide though. Uh, and also the Intel managed to come back in 2006. Later in 2007, uh, the Intel has the superior or we call the dark age of AMD because uh, as you can see in the performance uh, chart here, the Intel has a superior, it's more superior uh, to AMD both in multi-thread and single thread uh, performance. But in 2008, AMD managed to uh, surpass the Intel uh, hugely uh, in terms of multi-thread. But in the single thread, sadly, the Intel still has the upper hand until 2009. This is the summary chart. So uh, this is the important thing. First, uh, there is a huge spike in the 2017 because the AMD new architecture called Zen and also in 2019 uh, the second generation of Zen. Okay, so you may ask which one is the best. 
there are a lot of factors in buying CPU. There's price, performance, compatibility, and even features like uh, overclocking. All AMD processor can be overclocked, but for the Intel, only with the K uh, symbol can be overclocked. There is no clear best CPU. Uh, it depends on you. If you prefer the budget friendly and easy to upgrade later, and also uh, work great and multitask, uh, you can choose uh, AMD. But if you're looking for a single core performance that uh, great for gaming, and also you're looking for the premium a high-end processor, you can choose uh, Intel. I think that's for uh, my uh, talk. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Kevin, for the talk. Um, Akram, and over to you. Um, okay, hello, uh, Kevin, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I have two questions, but um, first question is, um, are you using AMD or Intel or none? Uh, currently, I'm using Intel for my laptop, um, okay. and I never ex have any experience uh, in AMD chips. Okay, so um, I'm using uh, AMD, and I find it sometimes uh, when using the uh, laptop, uh, AMD laptop, it feels uh, a bit lagging. So um, I just want your opinion and your recommendation. Um, which one is the best um, uh, processor for us computer science student to use or to buy, AMD or Intel? Uh, first, may I know your uh, AMD processor? Is it Ryzen? Or Ryzen? Oh, the Ryzen. Yeah. Uh, maybe the problem is because the temperature because AMD is well known of its uh, really hot uh, processor. So maybe that's why your laptop is uh, kind of lagging. Maybe you are doing a lot of tasks at the same time. And okay. for recommendation, uh, actually it depends on what you're going to do with the system itself. If you are just want to uh let's say do a programming i think uh, both of them uh it's fine because or maybe you can pick amd because it's uh budget friendly but if you're using the pro uh, the system uh, for another thing for example like gaming um, maybe you can pick intel because uh their single core performance still better than amd Mm, I have I have one more question. Uh, since you are using Intel, do you find any problem using that processor? Is there any problem that you face? Uh, from the processor side, I don't have any uh, problem with it. But because uh, I love to do uh, like open Google Chrome's, uh, I think I need a lot of RAM. But from the uh, processor side, I have no problem at all. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Asam, for the question. Uh, Kevin, uh, do you know that, uh, do you know in terms of market share, uh, AMD versus Intel, so who, who is ahead in terms of uh, market share, uh, if, if you know? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, currently the market share is uh, the biggest market share is still uh, Intel, but AMD is trying to catch up with their new Ryzen third generation later in, I'm not mistaken, in 2021 or maybe this end of year. So yes, Intel still uh, takes the lead. So uh, you mentioned that you you currently using your laptop, right? and then you yeah, I'm currently using my laptop. So how how long have you been using that laptop? Uh, it's, um, uh, it's uh, since two thousand and eighteen, uh, early two thousand and eighteen. I'm still using the i five, uh, eighth generation, but it's the processor is for the laptop so the power uh, i mean the performance is not better if you're using the, the desktop or a pc mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much, uh, Kevin, for the talk. Um, Thank you. <clears throat> um, so, during my days, my days, uh, okay, you can put it in the this form, okay, to do score for Kevin. <clears throat> so, during my days, uh, when I was about your, your age, uh, so I did follow closely um, Intel and also AMD uh, processor, the type, the slots, the slots that they use, uh, you know. Um, but now all that is just a distant memory. So now I'm just using laptop and not bothered to use uh, desktop anymore. But yeah, uh, interesting talk. <laughs> okay, uh, fill in the uh, mark for Kevin. And uh, next up is uh, Akmal Paris um, uh, about stock trading. And there here is going to ask the question. Okay. <clears throat> so whenever you're ready, you can go on. Yep. My name is Akmal Faris bin Azizul, and I'm going to learn about why youngsters don't stop trading. Okay, so uh, I'm going to break down this topic um, uh, bit why questions. So, why stop trading first? And then the second one is why start at a young age? Okay. So why stop trading? So first of all, um, sorry. Okay. I just Google it. Uh, uh, case those who don't know so much about stop trading. Stop trading refers to the buying and selling of shares in a particular company. If you own the stock, you own the uh, a piece of the company. So. That's much about it, okay. So why stop trading? So uh, the number one reason is it varies our source of income. So some of us, okay, uh, we set our mind after we graduate, we only focus on our nine, or oh, so we call nine to five jobs. Okay, maybe as a programmer, maybe as an, a normal office worker. So, but if you choose to stop, uh, to do stop trading, you can vary your source of income, maybe, um, um, you know, uh, as an, a part-time uh, stock trader. You can uh, double up and, uh, you know, uh, multiply your, your income. Okay. So the number two, uh, number two is acts as a backup. Okay. So why do I uh, tell you this is because, okay, in this uh, recent, um, uh, in this uh, recent days, okay, um, our economy is, you know, um, is gradually uh, recovering, okay. So some of the companies nowadays are struggling, you know, uh, to cut some costs. So they choose to sack, okay, maybe it's a bit harsh, but they choose to sack some of the uh, workers or maybe um, they offer their employees a so-called voluntary separation scheme or uh, better known as VSS. Okay, so what is VSS? Uh, VSS is just uh, the company's um, effort, okay, uh, to provide some perks in return of, um, you know, the, the employee itself to, uh, to vol voluntarily leave the company, okay? So, uh, that's much about it. Uh, moving on, it grows our sa uh, savings. Okay, so uh, that's this tip on stock trading, where you 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 grow your uh, your income as a stock trader. You don't use uh, your main source of income. Okay, uh, if you are working nine, uh, a nine to five job. Okay, for example. Okay. You don't use your main source of income. Maybe you have to pay your bills uh, for food and so on, but you use your savings instead. Okay, 
because if you lose your, your uh, those money you don't, uh, then you don't uh, you're not much affected by it okay so uh, okay uh, why stock trading again uh, can start with small uh, capital okay for example uh, why do i uh, say we, uh, you can do stock trading with small capital is because um, you know in other investment uh, sectors such as um, uh, you know uh, what do we call it um, real estate uh, in real estate uh, sectors for example they require huge capital okay? because uh, maybe for example a house may cost uh, uh, and a condominium will cost you about 300,000 ringgit so it, it is very uh, it is very hard for us maybe uh, students to start with uh, those kind of investments so stock trading will be a very much uh, a very well recommended um, step for us to to do investments okay so for example maybe you can start uh, with start uh, stock trading maybe 100 ringgit 200 ringgit depends on your savings okay so moving on Okay, why start at a young age? Okay, this is because uh, uh, for you to, uh, for us to gain the experience hands on for future sake at an early stage. Okay, um, so uh, I've been joining uh, a lot of groups with, uh, you know, <laughs> with boomers, so called boomers, um, maybe your dad's age, uh, my dad's age, okay, uh, 30s, 40s, okay. So they always say that. Why didn't I start earlier? Okay, so that's this kind of regret. Okay, um, uh, so maybe for us, uh, maybe, uh, we're at uh, we're at uh, the early stage of uh, twenty plus. Can so uh, it is well, uh, is it, it is recommended for us to start at a young age for us to at least gain this bit of uh, experience. Maybe it will uh, benefit us in the future. Okay, so the last point is it teaches us basics of personal financial planning. Okay, uh, as I uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, we do stock trading. Usually, we don't use our main source of income. Okay, we usually prefer those to do uh, stock tradings using um, using this amount of money that we save a little uh, bit by bit. Okay, from our savings. Okay. Uh, so, why I said so, uh, uh, the basics of personal financial plan, uh, planning is because, um, okay, uh, it, is, uh, it teaches us to save our money, okay? So, uh, for example, when we uh, graduated and we earn our job maybe as a programmer, okay, um, roughly maybe uh, our income would be like um, uh, early graduate maybe 4k or 5k so um as a uh, one tip is for you uh, to in order to um in order to join uh, stock trading is to save uh, this kind of amount okay for example when you have 5k um uh, monthly you set up um, an amount maybe 1k or maybe maybe 1k is too much 500 for your saving, uh, for your savings, okay. Maybe uh, after a few months, that those savings would stagger and uh, will will be compounded into a very huge amount. Okay, so that's all from me. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you, Ahmad. Um, over to the head last question. Uh, Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, okay, you can hear me. Yeah. Uh, did you do the stock trading? Yeah, I did. Um, I started a few a few weeks earlier. Oh, uh, how was your first experience in doing that? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I. It, it's such a good experience. Okay. Uh, you feel this kind of tension where you keep worrying about your money. Okay, it's it's normal. Okay, it's normal. You keep on uh, checking your portfolio. Uh, are you are you gaining or are you losing your money? Okay, but overall, it's a good uh, it's a good and uh, very meaningful experience for me. Okay, um, so 
until now uh, I do lose some money but uh, I compensated it uh, after a few trades. Okay, uh, my next question is okay. to do stock trading you need a broker, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, how do you find a re reliable broker? How do I find a reliable uh, broker? Um, I I didn't find it, but uh, it is based on my father's um, father's recommend uh, recommendation. Uh, I chose uh, M Plus Online. If you know about it, uh, uh, we have uh, a list of brokers in Malaysia for stock trading. We have Mi Bank, we have um, Public Bank, we have M Plus Online. So uh, the list goes on. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so, okay, Akmal, if I understand correctly, so you started trading stock just a few, few weeks back, is it? Okay. You, you started trading, trading stock a few weeks, just a few weeks ago, is it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, how much? <laughs> uh, what's, what's, what's the return right, like in terms of percentage? Uh, in terms of percentage? Uh, on my first trade, uh, I lose a bit, uh, maybe around uh, five percent. So my uh, my capital back then was one thousand. It is my saving, but not not all. Okay, uh, five percent maybe I lose about um, uh, fifty ringgit. Okay, but I compensated uh, on the next trade. I gain about ten percent. I uh, I gain one hundred plus. Uh, so. Uh, as I said earlier, okay, um, in order to do short trades, you, you must use your uh, savings, right? So although the, the gains is small, maybe 5%, 10%, but uh, in order to success in this, uh, in this sector, uh, you, you don't have to be greedy, but those uh, continuous success will, uh, will uh, be beneficial for the long term. Yeah. Okay. Um... So, I don't think that it's uh, highly risky to, to be involved in such trading. Uh, yeah, uh, but some uh, uh, some do say that it is highly risky, but uh, that's why I recommend uh, we start at a young age. Okay, uh, we don't have so um, so much to uh, we, we don't have much to lose, right? Okay, maybe from our savings, maybe we can fork out. Uh, maybe 500, uh, 600, okay? As we learn a bit by bit and maybe it will uh, be beneficial in the future as we earn a greater income, so on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that I, right. hope, uh, uh, I hope uh, all uh, are quite clear. Sorry, it's been so long I haven't speak to all of you. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, thank you, Akman. Uh, I actually use M Plus online myself, uh, <laughs> but I haven't started uh, investing in any stock, uh, uh, unfortunately. Um, so it's also uh, quite new to me as well. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you for the talk. Thank you. But yeah, I think in the future, I think uh, you guys should you know, seriously consider uh, <coughs> trading in stocks as well. Okay. Um, because uh, I think in terms of percentage, um, um, uh, in terms of yeah, it's a it's a risky um, business to be in. Uh, you there's a you know, chance uh, that you will lose money, but uh, I think the key uh, the key to it is uh, uh, knowledge. I mean, when to buy, which stocks to buy, I think those things we need to learn. Uh, which, I, I, which I haven't cut down yet. <laughs> uh, but okay, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Akman. Uh, so please, guys, stay in the uh, in the, the stage. And give Akman a score for the stock. Okay, uh, next up is Rafi. Uh, so we're going to talk about user interface, I think. Um, and Diana is going to ask a question. Rafi, 
Uh, whenever you're ready, you can, <coughs> you can start. Can you see my screen, Doctor? Uh, yes. All right. So, um, um, uh, good afternoon, Doctor. And hello everyone. Um, here I'm going to present my talk about uh, why UI and UX matters. So um, first of all, I would like to show you what will be covered um, in this talk. So the first thing I'm going to talk about um, what is UI and UX. And the second thing is uh, the importance of UI and UX. And the last thing is um, if we have to choose uh, one between UI and UX, which one is more important? So before I get started, I would like to highlight the good quotes about design. So design is not just only about aesthetics. It's the art of making things usable. And UX design is nothing without human. And uh, if a product is, is not fully able to send, serve it, its purpose, the design process is it's not complete. And this is why the UX designer need to be prepared to iterate and reiterate uh, their designs over and over again. So what's basically user interface or UI? It's basically the process of improving the presentation and the interactivity of the web or mobile application. It focuses on the app's look and interacts with the user. Um, each screen, page, uh, buttons, and other things you can see on the application they are all part of the user interface. And uh, there is um, one of the example of then bad uh, interface. Uh, all the buttons in the bad example are bold and prominent, which is not appropriate because the primary button is only the login. So we don't have to give um, a, bold, a bold and prominent button for the other option. And uh, let's now move to the user experience. Uh, user experience development is, on the other hand, is the procedure of improving the overall experience of the users when they interact with the application or the website in order to achieve its objective to provide the maximum um, customer satisfaction. It mainly focuses on the wireframing and application and creating the user flow. Um, here is the example of, of um, good and bad user in, uh, user experience. When the error happens, it's important to communicate with the user language, tone, and design. It's important to provide a clear and understandable reason for an error. As we can see in the in this the bad uh, user experience, it didn't specify or gives any detail about the error, so will it will confuse the the user. So the good way is we have to specify, like uh, let's say for the, the email has been used or um, or the email is, doesn't exist. And um, the importance of UI and UX, the primary goal of the business is to increase its sales and it, to increase the growth of the business. And UI and UX design plays a very essential role uh, to achieve this goal. UI and UX design, uh, can could prove, improve the user experience and customer satisfaction that helps to increase the number of the user of the specific application, especially for a startup or a new business. The importance of UI and UX design becomes even more crucial as the first impression lasts long and using UI and UX design can make or break the brand recognition. So um, UI uh, versus UX, which one is more important? Actually, many uh, UI and UX experts don't agree to compare them because, because both of them are two equal, equally important things and cannot be separated. But I would like to give a good opinion from one of uh, UI and UX design expert. So UX design always come first because because we can overlook a bad UI design, but we cannot dis disregard the bad user experience. A good UI is nice for a while, but at the end, if it doesn't solve your purpose, 
for what you have installed the app. Sooner or later, we will install uninstall the app because it's uh, it has a bad user experience. Um, one of the surveys that is conducted by Amazon Web Services says that 88% 80, 80, of the shoppers say that they wouldn't return to a website after experiencing a, a bad uh, user experience. And this shows us how important user experience is. Maybe that's all for me. Okay, thank you, uh, Rafi, for the talk. Um, so do we have Liliana here? Um, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so for my first question, what are the differences between UI and UX? And my second question is, uh, typically, what does a UI and UX designer do? Um, so um, uh, for the first question, uh, actually, user interface is more focused to to the interface or the all the risk, uh, all the components that appear on the screen, like the buttons, the choice of the colors. It more focused on how to create uh, a clean design and how to make the design responsive and has a consistent components of the design. But for the user experience, it focused more like to the how can I say it? Uh, the user flow of the app. It's focused more like how the user or, or the customer who's gonna use the app. Uh, like um, it's more focused on uh, the accessibility to the users. Um, can you repeat the second question? Um, typically, what does a UI and UX designer do? Like. I don't really understand the questions. What does a, a UI and UX designer usually do? What is their, their job scope? Um, as I uh, like mentioned before, for the user interface, they basically main focus on designing um, the, like deciding the colors of the app and uh, how they are going to make uh, the, the the interface is consistent. Let's say the choice of the icon. Some icon may, may have a, um, a bold, bold outline and they have to make it like consistent, make the app looks coherent. While for the U UX designer, they focus more on the workflow or the or the blueprint of the application. That's all. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, Diana for the question. Okay. Rafi, I have uh, one question. If you can, if you can uh, rate a uh, mobile app that you typically use, uh, which one do you think has the best uh, UI or uh, UX uh, user experience or user interface? If if there's any. Um. I'm not sure because there are a lot of um, applications that have a good a UI and UX, but I think um, most of the Apple products or like uh, the application that Apple made, they ha they are really have a good user and UX, uh, user experience design. Mm -hmm. so you yourself use uh, Apple product? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Rafi, for the talk. Yeah. Um, 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 okay. Uh, so kindly, um, kindly fill in the video form. For us, see. Um, okay, uh, can we give the uniforms in a few? Okay, so next is Atala. Okay. And next up is Atala and <coughs> Aziza Hayden. Okay. Atala, maybe you can. I uh, can see. Uh, 
Hello, Dota. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon to Dr. Reza and everyone. My name is Muhammad Nawfal Atala, and today I will uh, present to you uh, an offside rules in football. So in this, uh, in today's presentation, uh, I will discuss four main points uh, to, that I would like to share to you. The first one is the definition or the basic explanation of offside rule. The second is uh, the history of the implementation of offside rule. And the third is strategy and uh, a strategy <coughs> in offside rules. And the fourth one is the decision made on the offside rules. So, uh, offside uh, basic explanation is offside is one of the laws of association football codified in the law 11 of the laws of the game. A player is, an off, is in an offside position if any of their body parts, except their hands or the arm, are in the opponent's half of the pitch and closer to the opponent's goal line than both of the ball and second last opponent. However, the last opponent is usually, but not necessarily, the goalkeeper. Then, uh, being in an offset position itself is not an offset and is not an offense, but a player so position when the ball is played by a teammate can be judged guilty of an offset offense if they become involved, if, if involved in the active play interfering with the opponent or gain an advantage by being in that position. Next, uh, why is it exactly uh, uh, the offside rule are being made? So offside rule are invented to prevent players for, from goal hanging. Uh, this, is what, this was considered to be unsportsmanlike and make the game boring. In contrast, the offside rule forced the player not to get ahead of the ball and thus favor dribbling the ball and short passes over a few long passes. As you can see in the picture uh, to the right, uh, uh, offside was created to prevent this uh, particular uh, case. Uh, before the offside was created, uh, many people were just go hanging in like the circled man in the yellow one. In the blue one, in the, in the yellow circle, uh, people will just hang uh, in front of the goal and wait for the ball to be passed to them and then score the goal. Next uh, is the history of the offside rule. Uh, offside rule is, was originated in 1893. A player was considered offside unless three players of the opposing, opposing side are in front, of the, in front of him, including the goalkeeper. So in this uh, in this diagram or in this in this picture, the player in with the ball is considered offside because only two players are in front of him. Next, the office, the offside rule in 1925. The offside rule was changed in 1925, uh, uh, and it was a little bit different from the 1863 offside rule. A player was considered offside unless two players of the offensive team are in front of him, including the goalkeeper. So, in the above diagram, the player with the ball is not considered offside because two players are in front of him. Next, the offside rule changed again in 1990. In 1990, the offside rule was changed again in 1990 because uh, uh, because a player is onside in his level with the second to last player of the opposing team, including the goalkeeper, are not being considered offside anymore. So, in this above diagram, which is the same as the diagram in 1925 I provided, the player with the ball is not considered offside because he is leveled with the second to last player. This offside rule, which is created in 1990, uh, is being uh, used till nowadays. Next is the strategy of the offside rule. Uh, there's many strategy uh, around the offside rule. One of the examples I will providing is the offside trap. Offside trap is a defensive tactic designed to force an attacking team into an offside position. Just before an attacking player is played a true ball or a, la or a long ball, the last defenders move upfield, isolating the attackers into the offside position. The However, the execution requires careful timing by the defense and is considered as a risk uh, move, since running upfield against the direction of a an attack may leave the goal open and exposed. Uh, and then the decision of the offside. 
uh, offside was given by the sideline referees. Uh, when an offside fault was conducted, the referee would be raised their flag to give a signal to the main referee to the blow to then blow his whistle. But however, uh, the sideline referee is uh, is still only a human, uh, and uh, and therefore many mistakes happen during a match by a sideline referee itself. Because the football game is so fast and agile, it's not unfrequently that an error happens. To help the referee, many peop- many football associations have implemented the use of VAR or virtual assistant referee and other technologies to help them make the right, the right decision. However, many believe that VAR and other technologies are ruining the art of football itself, but that's a topic for another day. Uh, that is all for me. Thank you for your attention. Uh, is there any question? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes. So I have two questions about offside rule in football. Uh, the first one is, Uh, just now you mentioned that this rule was introduced in 1863, if I am not mistaken. So who was the inventor? I mean, was he or she is a football player or someone from fut- football federation? Uh, and the second question is, what will happen to the player if he or she did an offside? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, that's a good ex- the, that's a good question actually. Uh, the first question: uh, Who is the inventor of the offside rule? If I'm not mistaken, uh, while, while I, I am doing my research uh, uh, yesterday, the the invent the one who is invented the offside rule is called G. C. Tring. He was an as as as. Uh, as you can see, he is also an uh, a spectator or a, uh, or someone who was who was watching football and was so passionate to advocate the strictest offside law possible. Uh, he often criticized uh, existing offside law, uh, including in other sports such as rugby, who is implementing the their own offside rule. But he thinks that other sports uh, offside rule was be was. Two lux. Uh, his view really influenced the football association, and later was implemented on the year of 1863. Uh, as for the second question, uh, you asked for what happened to the player, right? Yes. Uh, so the team that the player was caught offside will lose the ball and will be handed to the opposite opposite side. For example, uh, there's uh, the team A was possessing the ball and was going to uh, to pass the ball to his attacker. However, his attacker is in the, an offside position, so the team A will no longer have the possession possession of the ball and will uh, and a free kick will be granted to the team B. Uh, furthermore, if in such case a goal was scored whilst being in an offside position, the goal will be ruled out and will not be counted. However, there are some modifications uh, throughout the year, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, the most significant uh, significant change uh, was created last year by the football association football association of England. They they uh, whenever the player is in offside position, they let the players uh, they let the play go on, and the, if the player scored the goal, then they will be ruled offside. Not immediately ruled offside, but the player are being handed an opportunity to score the goal uh, and the play is on. I think, uh, I hope the, I hope my answer, my, I hope my answer is good enough. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Aziza. Thank you, Aziza. I think I have a question. <clears throat> okay, in, 19, in your side, you say in 1990, the rules uh, outside uh, change again. Okay, in 1990, um, where uh, the play is considered offside if the, uh, the play is um, level with the second last opponent, right? 
Um, so why why do you, why do you think the change was made uh, instead of two opponents in front of him to uh, uh, to be level with the second second master team? Why uh, why do you think? He I think before, uh, if the player was behind the defender, it was caught. It was on site. However, uh, maybe the some play. Uh, I think there's some player. They are so fast and agile. They can time and they they, are, they have a smart. Uh, they have uh, they have a smart uh, tactic and they are intelligent to make the run uh, and make them on site as the ball was played. So. Maybe uh, as the football evolving uh, in 1990, there are a lot of players that are fast and agile and pacey. So the so the football association changed it to make the attacker feel easier to score the goal. Maybe is that the explanation? Okay. And uh, you mentioned about AR uh, helping the referee, right? Um, has it been implemented in any uh, major tournaments? So, uh, the, the, there is two major technologies that are being used right now in the football world. Uh, the first one is the goal line technology. Uh, goal line technology, I believe, was being tested. It was being used for the first time in 2014 World Cup. Uh, so the goal line technology was uh, basically a sensor that uh, a sensor or a camera that uh, record the goal line, and whenever the ball was crossed the line, it will give a signal to the referees, which is uh, using uh, some kind of a watch that will de determine with it, with, with whether the goal was given or not. The second one is the VAR. VAR is stand for a virtual assistant referee. Virtual assistant referee, I believe, was being used for the first time in the 2018 World Cup. Uh, so the virtual assistant referee is more like a playback. So a referee can only view an accident or a foul once, right? So VAR or virtual assistant referee actually help the assistant referee on the side or in the stadium to give the call to the main referee to decide whether they want to review the decision or they want to stick to the main decision. Uh, both VAR and technolo goal line technology, I think, are still being used nowadays. But uh, as I mentioned before, many believe that it's ruining the art of football and there's a lot of controversy and conspiracy be behind it as well. Okay. Uh, the controversy is maybe. Uh, yeah, some people believe that VAR only, uh, what do you say, only good for the big clubs or only useful for the big clubs and will bring harm to the lower or a smaller clubs because as you can as you can see, many people use uh, many people will believe that there's some money behind it or something. Uh, I'm not sure because there's no evidence yet, but I still enjoy football nowadays. Uh, it brings it brings uh, honesty to the players itself because nowadays you cannot cheat anymore because there's video recording of you being be, uh, of you cheating, and it can be reviewed by the referee over and over again. Okay, All right. Okay, thank you, uh, Doctor, uh, for your time. Uh, Good afternoon. So this, so this concludes our session for today. So please don't forget to give uh, Atala your marks to, to the same uh, link there, big link. Uh, in the okay, uh, and it marks the end of our uh, class for today. Uh, thank you everyone for staying until the end of our class. Um, so uh, we will see you again uh, next week. So next week, we have another set of talks involving... It's um, um, going to be 11 talks next week. Uh, sorry. Next week. Um, 30th of November. Uh, 12 talks. 
uh, next week. So please see the schedule. Uh, so whether you wanna the schedule is uh, next week or not. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'll see you again next week. Thank you, doctor. 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 Thank you, doctor.